When we lived here, there were only three families living in, in Redstone. Uh, us up at the ranch, Clayton's down here at the gatehouse, the lower gatehouse, and then the Kinney's who were taking care of all of this property. Uh, John Kenny. Yeah. So there were only three families. The train used to run by once a week to Marble. And there was a post office down in Redstone that Mrs. Kenny took care of when she wasn't doing other things than being a teacher. <laughs> So this was kind of your playground, if you will. Uh, this was our playground. We uh, got into every building, <laughs> I believe, in Redstone. We found ways in. We found how to get into the mansion. My older brother, I think Ted, is the one who found a window ajar in the maid's quarters. So he got that window open and we came in and went through the mansion all over from room to room. While we were in here, John Kenny was out there mowing the lawn with a team of horses and a gang mower. And he knew we'd been in here because we would put our finger on the dust on top of the table there. So he knew somebody was in here. Of course, he knew who it was. Yeah, we just, I think, went through every room in there. Yeah. And we never damaged anything. No, we just went never through took to anything. look to see what was in here. It was all original at that time. It means a lot to me. It's just with all the owners prior till Steve and April bought it, you know, seems to me like they took more out of it than they put in. Because a lot of the furniture that was in here disappeared. The silverware that was in here disappeared. Because we remember it as all the kitchenware still hanging above the stove, I think it was, mm -hmm. down in the kitchen, the original. It actually seemed like whoever was living here was only gone for the weekend or a week. Because other than that, it appeared to be lived in. It was kept that nice. The, we were up here at the uh, ranch and we had to walk to school each morning and then come back. And of course, uh, I think Freddie says about a mile and a half, but once you went down by the powerhouse and out through that where the road went before, it may go a little bit more than a mile and a half. And no matter what the snow depth was, we had to go to school. <laughs> and also, mom would when, when milk the cows. She, we would take milk down to the uh, Kenny's. I think there was somebody else we took milk to, too. Mrs. McDonald. Yeah, and when they went down, Freddie remembers when the, it was so cold that uh, froze and put the cap up above the, where the a cap down on top of the bottles. I had three quarts of milk that I cradled in my arms and by the time we got to Redstone you didn't dare close your eyes because they would freeze your eyelashes so you couldn't see. But when we got to Redstone, the caps were up off of the bottles about that far. It was so cold. You could see the remnants still of where the uh, coal facility was down here where they dumped the coal in and sorted it. And then also the uh, coke ovens. There were two rows of coke ovens. And uh, they were pretty well 
all intact at that time. But along came the war effort, and at that time then they came up and they jerked all of the uh, fronts off of the coke ovens in order to put for the war effort. So the original we see today is not what the original was at that day. And by the, we come sometime down here, but most times it's over by the power plant. And there was a bridge right above the power plant that you had to come across, which is no longer there. And also there was a house on this side of the uh, bridge and who lived in there was the caretaker while Mrs. McDonald was here of the power plant. His name was Joe Lally. Mm -hmm. And uh, he lived down in uh, Glenwood, but came up here in order to take care of the plant. In later years, after more population got here and the inn opened, for uh, yes. a hotel. So uh, we would, mom would make pastries and churn butter and uh, separate cream, milk into cream, and we delivered that to Redstone people that were living there. I think really how she kept Redstone going was John Kinney. And uh, he was the caretaker of all their estate. And he would do the uh, sewer, uh, sewer that was there, the water he, uh, he took care of. And uh, I think that was the gentleman who really kept uh, Redstone going. In the winter time, when snow got deep, he had to shovel the snow off of the roofs. And that's how deep it got up here. And then our stepdad, Fred Montevere, would also help him shovel off those roofs. She started selling off buildings because she was being taxed on the buildings that were here. And I, either she could no longer afford to pay the taxes, so she started selling off the buildings to be torn down. And there's still some parts of it in Glenwood. There's a couple of houses. Well, the one house is gone. Yeah. But uh, there's a rock house down there that all the rock came from up here. But there were a lot of buildings the schoolhouse was torn down. The clubhouse was torn down. The Bighorn Lodge was torn down. Uh, of course, the barn finally they, they tore, they it, tore apart. it down. So she had to sell off some buildings, probably to pay taxes. But before, when we first came here, this was just like I said before. It was just like someone had gone for the weekend. I worked here in the mansion. I did when too. <laughs> we both did, I guess. Yes. Back when they opened it for, it wasn't a bed and breakfast. What? No, the wealthy people from Texas came up here to have. I guess they're R&R, &R, and uh, that was who they uh, actually had here in the uh, mansion. Uh, at that time, Mrs. Hibbard was one of them who owned it, and that's who I think both of us worked for, Yeah, was Mrs. <laughs> Hibbard. I remember cleaning the carpet stairway that goes upstairs and uh, would take a, a container of water and clean cloths and would use that to wipe down the stairway all the way from the top to the bottom to clean it. 
That's a big job. In a house <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> and other times, I don't know what all we did. I, uh, when I was here, the hot water for the building was a small, uh, I guess, the furnace is what it was, and you had to stoke it with uh, coal and also then wood in order to keep the hot water going. And the furnace was there also, which was a mammoth furnace. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's what I remember much. And of course, at that time, we were pretty well insulated from the outside world. And one thing they brought in was oranges. And I, we had not seen oranges. <laughs> and occasionally, maybe we would, uh, I would take and uh, partake of uh, orange. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we came up here, but I think Ernest and yeah. Marge were yes, here too. We were. Uh, and we've stayed in the mansion more than once, probably half dozen times yeah. that we've come up here to eat dinner and stay in the mansion. But yeah, we uh, had, I think we had Lady Bountiful's room. Yes. They were higher class than we were because yeah. we were over here on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> what did it mean to you to be able to celebrate your anniversary? Oh, here? terrific. First, of course, I married Edna. I was single and working for Bertha Motors and chasing around and I had a car and mm -hmm. we'd go to dances and what have you. And During the noon hour, I'd just get on a creeper and I'd roll under a car to sleep. Because <laughs> that was the only time I slept almost. But uh, finally Mrs. Berthod said, you need to find a nice girl and get married. And I said, listen, Aline, I said, if you could find me a girl that didn't drink, smoke, or chase around, boy, I'd be interested in being a smart aleck. And so, I don't remember how much later, months later, she said, remember what you told me? If I could find you a girl that didn't drink, smoke, or chase around, you'd be interested. And I said, yeah, yeah. And so, she said, well, I'll tell you what. She says, she's living with the lady that brings her car in here. Flossie Goreski, and she works at the Bryant Drugstore, just around the corner from where the garage was that we were in at the time. So she said, if you go in there about quitting time, you'll see her come in to wait for Flossie. So I went in and sat down and had a strawberry short. <laughs> and here comes this girl in and I looked at her and she went up and talked to Flossie so I was pretty sure that was her and I thought to myself hmm a little bit chubby but nice <laughs> 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 and uh, I think it was the very yeah the very next day I, I went up to the house where she was living and asked her to go to the ball game with me. And surprised enough, she agreed to go. So I told her who I was and I knew Flossie and all that. And so she did go to the ball game with me. And from there, uh, we started going together. I didn't chase around. <laughs> as as Freddie did, I was more subdued. And anyway, uh, I'd heard from Freddie that the had a that uh, Edna had a sister, and uh, I said, "Could you maybe fix up a date with me?" 
So I go to the house that uh, evening, and uh, as I was sitting there, uh, Marjorie was there with another girl, and they went out the door and said, we're going to the show. <coughs> so anyway, then uh, Edna and Freddie and I went to the show. And when we went down there, came back out, and uh, one thing I never liked to do was dance. And I asked uh, Marjorie and the other girl, would you like to go to a dance in Aspen? And that's the furthest from my mind that I wanted to go to Aspen to dance. <laughs> but he went up to the dance and uh, sat there and didn't know really what to do. Uh, pretty soon somebody asked the girlfriend to dance. And so then Marjorie and I got out on the floor and I think we stepped on each other's feet more than we danced. <laughs> and so then after that, I asked Marjorie out. And uh, uh, then uh, uh, we uh, had, uh, uh, actually before that, I worked for a logging company at Lenado. And I had to correspond back and forth to her down there, and the only way was by mail. And so the lady, or the girl who was there, she said, I'll mail it for you. So she took and put the letter up to her lips and put a big old lipstick mark on it <laughs> and sent it down, and she got that down there and wondered what the world it was. <laughs> So anyway, when I got down, I told her that Molly Marsing had done that. And then from there, finally went down to uh, Glenwood after I finished uh, the spring up there at the logging company, went down and uh, oh, I worked for a, a tire recapping place for a little bit, then went over to Berthods for a very short time, then in turn was able to get a job down at the bank. And so then in turn I uh, kept dating Marjorie, and finally then uh, we did get married. Ours is 68. 68? <laughs> 67. And we've been buried 68 years. Wow. I always have to ask my wife those <laughs> particulars many times because she knows it. <laughs> In other words, I was hired to bank as a bookkeeper and uh, then in turn graduated up to be a teller. And at that time, I was only making $100 a month. And so it was pretty tight to be able to do anything. So I had uh, then, when we got married, before that I still had some side jobs when we got married. Then in turn I was the janitor at the bank as well as doing my regular job. When we got married I was making 125, 120, I got a look at her, $125. And that kind of money we couldn't uh, really make much living because at that time we were paying $45 a month rent. And so finally uh, uh, we decided we can't continue to pay rent. We needed to buy a place of our own. So we found the house on 9th Street and uh, we had to go to the Italian banker to get this done because we didn't have, Marjorie had saved back money and uh, we put the, what the down payment was and then in turn we borrowed the money. Actually, the, the Italian banker was our mother and uh, stepfather. And they <laughs> lent us the money and of course made it very clear that this is a loan, and in turn, it's to be paid 
as they indicated to be paid, and I think it was a monthly payment. And we did, and we did pay off the house, which we still have. But we built across the street. My uh, wife was born uh, half a block of where we <laughs> live today. So her movement was only from the house that uh, the, that her mother owned. We moved up the street a half block and then across less than a half block. Well, of course, I would explain what it was like when we first saw the castle way back in 1939 or 38. That now today it looks almost the same, minus some of the furniture, some of the silverware, and that sort of thing. But they've restored the castle to what almost it was back then. It's remarkable. Oh, they've done a remarkable job. Yeah, I think this is more a giving rather than a taking, which the previous owners did. In other words, what they wanted, they took out of here. Of course, they were the owner of it, but they took it out and did not leave it for the historic value of what the castle was, what also the stables were over there. No longer uh, did they uh, keep it as, as original. But today we were able to go, I mean, previous to this, we were able to go through down here to the stables and still yet remember what the stables were and they looked a lot like what it was in those days. The uh, stanchions for the horses was uh, varnished wood and uh, was uh, something you don't see today that it still is original. Till we came in the mansion, we'd never seen anything like this. <laughs> and uh, today, it's, in some respects, is even better. They opened up a room in here and makes it look much more open, but they've got everything restored back as close to original as they can. And it's one beautiful building. There was a large, well, we call it large lake up there that uh, was there that was for the water storage for the power plant. And then there was a head gate up there that when they ran the power plant, they came up and opened it up and there was a wood a uh, pipe that went all the way down, and it was a slap type pipe, and ran all the way down to the powerhouse. Uh, but I say the the only we, time we had lights up there was when Mrs. McDonald was here. Once she left, it was <laughs> back to darkness again. <laughs> and the memory I have of uh, the Tibbets were that when we got out of school, Freddie and I tried to hurry up the, to go home, but the Tibbets caught up with us and they were always thumping us. <laughs> and you talk of bullies, well, that was it. <laughs> and so finally, you know, we didn't know what to do. But anyway, uh, there it would be a stepbrother, right, who it was, who from up there at Placida. He happened to get off work early because he had heard about this. So anyway, they uh, he came and he drove. To, he saw him down there roughing us up. So he came down and got the two of them and grabbed them by the shirt, and he butted their heads together, <laughs> and he said. If you ever do <coughs> any more to those boys again, he says, I'm going to do worse. And after that, the two never bothered us again. <laughs> so the bullying was over.
Well, there's just so many people now compared to what there was then. All the original housing was still here when we first came up, and but there's nobody living in there. So the population was, like I say, three families. And then gradually, as they started to, uh, people out of California, I think, came to the Redstone Inn and opened it. And then, of course, they opened the mansion to tourists. But uh, now, of course, you drive down the street and it's just like any other little town. But back then it wasn't. <laughs> you know, it wasn't running at any time when we were here, but it was moved to Glenwood. And if you go down in West Glenwood, it's still there. Part of it. They tore it down and moved it to Glenwood. But the greenhouse was right down here, just across the river. And uh, it was always there, and nobody vandalized it or anything. It had all glass windows, and but that's the only building I think we never went in. <laughs> no, we went down and looked on the outside to see what it looked like, but as far as going inside, no, we didn't. Were you ever in the Bighorn Lodge? We, uh, when we lived up at. Uh, cow camp in Coal Basin, the road went right by the Bighorn Lodge. And in the front of the Bighorn Lodge, as I remember, there was a Bighorn sheep encased in, I think it was glass or something that was up there. And as we rode by, we could see the Bighorn Lodge, but we never did go, in. go up to it. <laughs> we didn't visit it. <laughs> <laughs> and also to mention something about when we lived in Coal Basin, then we lived in the cow camp, or the Bar Fork Cow Camp. And uh, when Mom and Dad went to ride, Freddie and I were there to be able to wander around, and we went up to the uh, Coal Basin town which at that time was still all intact except for some of them that the snow caved in. And we would go into the, to the houses and the beds were still there, the dressers were still there, and uh, it looked like you know somebody maybe was going to come back. And went over to where the mine tipple came down and uh, looked at it, the general store was there, we went into it, and uh, the fashion books were still there. Opened the fashion books and looked at them, and then put them back underneath again. So when you walk through here today, or when you've been here, is it just like stepping back into the past? Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. When you look in here, there's one thing that really stands out to me is the woodwork that is here the oak woodwork. Today, to be able to replicate that woodwork is going to be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars when you look at this building here. When we built our home, uh, we took and built it with uh, oak uh, all the way through it. And we found out the cost of having to build with that type of material. And I think it's just admirable to look at this building to see the originality of a lot of this. Yeah, we would go in the inn quite often. And uh, so I got up in the clock tower and waited till cars, a car came up the avenue and I'd sit up there and turn the hands on the clock. <laughs> I don't know whether the people driving up could see that or even noticed it, but anyway, we that's what we did. <laughs> but then the end of it was John Kenny came up to Mom again 
and said, somebody's been in that inn and they've turned the clock <laughs> because he knew where it was set. And generally, Mom gave us a stout talking, don't you boys do that anymore. But it didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> My first job was to, uh, the mechanics would take parts off of a car and in order to clean them up, I'd take them out on the sidewalk in a pan of gasoline <laughs> and wash the parts in gas and take the hose and hose it off. And of course, it was just a block away to the river. Uh, I mean, we couldn't do that today. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, uh, he kept teaching me things about mechanics and started me working on cars and uh, finally became not a mechanic yet, but was able to do some mechanical work. And that was in 1948, they built the Tamarack, what is now the Tamarack Mall. Uh, they built that building for their repair shop. And uh, 1948, they started it. And I remember pouring, wheeling a wheelbarrow pouring cement for 18 hours <laughs> in order to build the lower part of the, of the building. Then in 1949, they hired a bricklayer to come in and build the rest of the building. And uh, then I was we started a machinery business selling Ferguson tractors. And uh, I would take a little tractor and we also took on New Holland balers. And I would tow the baler down into the basement to put it together and get it adjusted. And then when I went to pull it out of the basement, I'd have to have a couple of mechanics come and stand on the front of the tractor axle to keep the tractor down so it would pull the baler out of the basement. And uh, so we ran our machinery business that way. The first car line that we had uh, supposedly a franchise for was Tucker. Hmm. And if I remember, they gave, paid about $1,000 for the franchise and they got a few parts, but we never saw a Tucker because it was never manufactured. Uh, soon after that, of course, then we took on Hudson, and we sold Hudson's. At that time, uh, one day, Louie and Aline went down to their house, which was just a block away, to uh, eat lunch. And I was going to repair a spring hanger on a customer's car. It was an old 19... 34 brand of some kind and I had to use the torch to free up the spring shackles and when I went to turn the torch off I wasn't watching close enough but the, I had it jacked up the gas tank was on the back and it was leaking gas we had just watered washed down with water and I didn't notice, I went to turn the torch off and <laughs> set the floor on fire, the car on fire. I, before Louie even know it, they had called, we had called the fire department and it just burnt that car to the ground down in the basement. It 
pitted a lot of the tools from the chemicals of the of putting the fire out. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and all <laughs> Louis would say, well, there was a fire extinguisher there. Why didn't you use it? And I said, well, Louis, I pushed on the button, but it wouldn't do anything. Well, of course, you have to pull the pin out and then push on the lever. <laughs> So because of that, I burnt the, <laughs> had a terrific fire in the basement. And all he said was that. He <laughs> never gave me hell or anything. Wow. And of course, then I was, I hadn't met Edna yet. And a friend of mine, Don Alsbury, and I, buddied around together. He was in the same grade in high school. And we'd go to dances in Carbondale, Elgebel, Basalt, Aspen, and stay out all night. And like I say, when I got to work, in order to get any sleep, I, at noon I'd roll under the car on a creeper. And uh, so in the, somewhere along the way there, I would get sleepy at night because it wasn't getting any sleep. And I would run off the road going to sleep in the car. And once there at Basalt, in the, where the road turned into the salt and out. I went to sleep, drove the car off into a big snowbank. Next morning, Ernest and I went up with the wrecker and got it out. And the final blow was when, um, well, I guess it was before that, when Louis said to me, oh, I went to Denver with Don Alsbury because he was an auctioneer and he would haul cattle to Denver after the sale. And he always begged me to go to Denver with him to keep him company. And I said, oh, I can't. I said, I got to be to work in the morning. He said, we'll be back in time. Oh, yeah. We got back, it was about 2 o'clock. And boy, was Louis mad. He said, where have you been? He said, we've seen your car parked here this morning. I've called the sheriff's office, the police department. No one has seen you, and you just worried us to death. And so I told him the story. He said, well, I don't care. He said, listen. What I want you to do is decide, do you want to work or do you want to play? And I said, oh, no, no, he said. He said, I want you to think about it for the rest of the day. He said, then when it comes quitting time, I want your answer. Come quitting time, all the other mechanics gathered their lunch pails and left. And I thought, oh, boy, Louis forgot. No, no, he did not forget. <laughs> so he said, well, what's your decision? And I said, oh, I, no, he said, now, before you say it, you have to mean it. He said, I don't want this ever to happen again. And I said, oh, Louis, I said, yes, I do want the job. I do want to work, and I won't be late again. So it was the next weekend or the weekend after that, we uh, went to Delta because uh, Don's girlfriend lived in Aspen, went up and got her, and then went to Delta. And uh, the girls said, uh, well, if you'll stay overnight, we'll sleep with you. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so that was Saturday night. Nope. Saturday night, things came up. That didn't happen. So then Sunday came, and we drove all around doing things. And so uh, they said, uh, I looked at my watch, and I said, Don, I got to go. No, he said, we're supposed to be here tonight. They're going to sleep with us tonight. <laughs> and I said, not me. <laughs> I said, I cannot be late for work. Cannot. And I said, I won't stay. And finally, I go to him into coming with me, and we took off. The old 37 Chevy burnt lots of oil. We got to Grand Valley, and uh, the rods started knocking for the lack of oil. So I thought, gosh, where am I going to get oil? So I went in behind the Texaco station. Now this was the wee hours of the morning. And uh, I was going to go get some waste oil out of their waste oil can. So I'm out there, found a can, got some waste oil, and about the time I got my can full of oil, the owner opened the door and a dog came running out. <laughs> I ran like hell to get to the highway where our car was parked, put the oil in it, and went on to Carbondale. And I was staying in a, I was renting a room in a house, lady's house in Carbondale. Don had parked his car there, and he said, uh, why don't you go to Aspen with me? He said, we'll be back in time to go to work. And I said, no, no dang way. I said, I promised Louie I would not be late, and I'm not going to be. And so I wouldn't go with him. He went by himself, and by darn, I was at work on time, and never, ever was I ever late to work, ever. <laughs> so that was a fairly good lesson. <laughs>